Hello, GopherCon, and welcome to my talk. I'm Doug Donahoe. I'm from the New York Times, and I'm going to be talking about how we use Go and BadgerDB to solve uh, one of the problems we are working on. So the structure of this talk is I'll introduce myself in the New York Times first, then I'll describe the problem we were having, then the algorithm we conceived to solve that problem, and then I'll share some lessons I learned writing this uh, solution in Go using BadgerDB. So first, again, my name is Doug Donahoe. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been here for about five years. In the past, I lived in California. I worked for some startups you might have heard of called Netscape and Blue Martini Software. I then had my own company for a while writing computer games. One of them was called DD Poker. I then uh, moved back to the Midwest and worked at a high-frequency trading startup and then a health and wellness startup called Retrofit. I did a stint at Google, and now I'm at the New York Times where I'm on what's called the Publishing Pipeline team, and I'm gonna be describing the work we do as part of that team. I've uh, mostly done work in the JVM languages. I've done a lot of Scala and Java and a bit of Groovy. I have done a few pro professional work in Python and Ruby. And then a long time ago, I programmed in C and C++, but it's been a while. And most recently, I've learned Go, which has been a cool language to learn. So I work for the New York Times, where our mission is we seek the truth and help people understand the world. It's an important mission for a lot of the folks that work at the company. It's what attracted me to the company. Uh, the New York Times has been around for a long time, for over 169 years. Our first edition was published September 18th, 1851. And here's a image of that paper on our screen. Um, we do use Go at the New York Times for several things. Uh, any visit you make to our website or to a mobile app will hit a number of services, including our event tracker, how we do privacy, um, our paywall meter, and our preferences. Uh, we also use it for admin tools like the back end to the crossword puzzles or our weddings and recipe uh, functionality. And then on my team itself, we use it a lot for a lot of our tooling. We also have some open source projects you can check out if you like. I'm not going to get into them in detail here. Uh, one of them is called Gizmo. It's a framework for building uh, web applications and APIs in Go. So let's talk about the problem we are facing. First, I'll give you some background information about how we uh, publish our articles here at the New York Times. We use the term called publishing assets. So when you see something on our website, <clears throat> like this article about black holes, it's actually comprised of multiple assets. Uh, the first asset is called an article. It has a unique ID, a URI. You see it there, the MIT colon slash slash article with a UUID followed after it. Every article has its own unique ID. So the article has a bunch of components in it. Uh, there's the kicker, which is the out there at the top. There's the summary text. There's the headline. And then there's the body of the article. So all of this data is uh, captured inside the publishing asset, or sorry, the article asset. Uh, there's another asset here, which is the image of this black hole rendition. Uh, it has its own URI, and it has other fields like uh, the caption or who took the, who took the photo or rendered the image. Uh, there's a section asset. This, in this case, it's the science section. You can see it in the top left. There's the person or the author who wrote this article. He has his own URI, uh, Dennis Overby. And then under the covers, there's the subject of this article, space and astronomy. This is used for, it isn't rendered in this particular image here, but it's used to place it in the search index and help uh, place ads on this page. We have lots of other types of assets. At the top level, we've got things like the article I just showed you, interactives, like a lot of the things we've done for elections and for COVID uh, and newsletters. Uh, we have a whole taxonomy, which we use to tag our articles with who it's about, the organization, location, things like that. We call those times tags. Um, we will group things together. That's how a lot of the sections in our site work. Uh, those are called legacy collections. We also have slideshows for images and playlists for things like podcasts. And then finally, we have concrete items which we write about. So there's videos and movies and theaters and things like that. All of these are independent assets that we have in our system. Now it's important to note that assets refer to each other. We sort of think of them as parent-child relationships. 
Um, the article I showed you before referred to this image, and it also referred to the subject of astronomy. The image itself also refers to the subject. And then there's the section it was in and the person it was written to. Uh, the other thing that can happen is we can have another article which shares these things. So another article might be about space and astronomy in the science section, but it might be written by a different author and have a different image. And when these things are published, we sort of think of them as published in topological order. So they're published sequentially. I'll get more into that in a second. In the order, when, we, when you think of them ordered properly, it's a topological sort. So everything, for example, to publish and preview and display Article 1 has to come before it, before you can render it properly. Likewise with Article 2. Now, how do we uh, publish these things? Uh, we use Kafka. There's a good NYT Open post about this that was written a few years ago by one of my colleagues. Um, it talks about this in depth. But in general, we have a bunch of content management systems and archives and other systems that will publish content onto the monologue, which is a single partition Kafka topic. And then there's a bunch of consumers of that topic which send it to places like the search index and the website and mobile apps. So when things get published onto them, they get published one at a time and they end up in this long list. And so uh, as they're published, they get what's called an offset. So the first one is offset zero, then offset one, offset two and three, et cetera. So eventually we'll publish all of the things we need. And when the article itself gets published, it should have everything it refers to on the monologue prior to it. Then we might see a second article and new information. Another thing we should point out is that some assets many times have multiple revisions. So when article one is updated, maybe with uh, a correction, they fix a typo or something like that, there'll be a new revision of that article as an asset on the monologue. So today we have over 59 million assets that have been published and it increases every day. So uh, one of the uh, issues is that things, we only started using the monologue in 2017. And so we started publishing things from 2017 and then we went back and added things from the past in big chunks. And this, this graph sort of represents that. So from the bottom, which is offset zero, that's the very first thing we put on Kafka, all the way up to 60 million, which is the most recent thing that's on Kafka, you can see the order in which things were added. And then from left to right is the year, 1851 would be our earliest article, and then 2020 is our most recent. And so you can see there's been a long continuous stretch of current publishing, that's the blue line on the right, and then some intermittent uh, bulk republishes, that's the red to green bits. Uh, and so this, uh, th this method of publishing stuff on the log lead, led to a, a few problems. So the first one is that there is <clears throat> this chronological disorder. Um, in order to uh, read all the assets from a particular year, say 2018, you had to read the entire monologue. So you had to process 59 million assets in order to get only maybe 100,000 or a million that you're interested in. And this could take hours and hours or days depending on the implementation details. A second thing was that because of the bulk republishes and a couple bugs and data issues, we had some topological ordering issues. So in this example, I might get to an article that refers to an image, but that image hasn't been published yet. So if we were to try and render this on our site, we might get a 404, for example. And then another problem we had was uh, we had lots of duplication. So um, there were uh, multiple bulk republishes, as you can see those three multiple stripes. Some articles were put on there multiple times. There were some bugs. One notable instance from uh, the midterms a couple years ago is that a subject was replicated over 900,000 times. And then there's uh, just duplicate republishes where nothing really meaningful changed. So we wanted to fix this, and the thinking was we could somehow sort all this data chronologically and then deal with the topological issues as they arose. So the initial approach was putting some stuff in SQL, doing some queries to arrange and clean the data, and then exporting it, and then throwing it into T-sort for a final sort. The problem was that this approach was complex, and it was taking sometimes weeks to run some of these queries. This diagram I have here was the explanation of the work done today when I joined the project. And it, it, there were a lot of steps. It was, it was hard to sort of keep in your head. 
So we, we kind of needed a new approach. And since I was new to the team, I took a step back and thought, what can I do about this? So at first, I didn't think this was a, like a big data problem. It wasn't billions of records. It wasn't petabytes of data. I, I, it didn't occur to me that I needed to use Hadoop or Hive or Spark or something like that to solve this. And I was looking at my laptop I was just issued. It had 16 gigabyte of RAM. And I thought, could I fit 59 million records into memory? Could I sort of do this in place and, and on a single machine? So I did the math. And uh, if you divide 16 gigabytes by 59 million, it's roughly 300 bytes uh, per record that you have you can play around with. So I thought it seemed possible that we could represent the specific data we needed in that amount of memory. And then I looked uh, from projects in the past, I, thought, I sort of thought maybe I could use a key value database as part of the solution. And this algorithm sort of started forming in my head. And so this is what I thought I could do. The first step would be to take the assets and then encode them, make them smaller, and then give them a unique timestamp and then insert them into a key value database, sort of like this. And then what that allows me to do is I can iterate by timestamp, which is important for the, the next steps in the algorithm. This orders things pretty much the right way, but we have to deal with a couple issues after this. The, the first one is to find and resolve missing references. So as we scan through uh, all, of the, all of the assets from earliest to latest, we keep track of when we see a missing reference. So we might encounter an article that refers to an image that didn't precede it uh, chronologically. So we'll just keep track of that. And then later on, when we actually see that image, we can go back and resolve it. And so the way we fix that is by making a copy of the article. So we copy it, keep everything intact, and then that reference happens to be good. And what we do is we keep the old one because it still was actually published at that time. So we just delete that missing reference. And in this way, we're actually mirroring sort of what happens in real life in, in the newsroom. There's uh, articles are often revised, information is added to them. So having a simulation of a republish to add an image is really mirrors reality. So one thing to keep in mind is that as we do this, that we could have up to 200,000, 300,000 missing references sort of in flight at the same time. So we need to be able to keep all this in memory. The solution for finding duplicates is the same. <clears throat> we're scanning the log from earliest to latest. We're sort of keeping track of the fingerprint or the MD5 of each asset. And when we see a new version of the same asset, we compare them. So as we walk through, we go, oh, we're at article two. And uh, we see it's a duplicate. So we delete the latest version of it. Likewise, when we get to the art image three, which is a duplicate, we can mark that. So the important thing to note is that we need to track over 20 million unique URLs in memory at the same time because we have to do this sort of in one pass. So there's a little bit more detail to the actual algorithm, but those are the three major concepts. And so those drove the following needs. First, we needed to be able to be really fast. We needed an iteration cycle to test out this algorithm in minutes instead of weeks and days. It needed to be efficient in memory. We needed to be able to cache things in memory and a large amount of it because to find those broken refs and those duplicates, we need to be able to pass through a lot of data. Likewise, we needed to persist data in between these steps. So we needed to be able to store them on disk compactly. We needed to have key value based lookup. And most crucial, we wanted to be able to iterate by key in sorted order, what's called lexicographic order. We also wanted to be memory efficient. So what did I choose? So I chose Go, honestly, primarily because it was something I had just learned for a smaller project I had worked on when I joined the company. But a lot of Go work was going on at the New York Times. And it seemed kind of suited for this type of work. It was sort of close to the metal, not as close as C, but seemingly close enough. It had good support for Kafka already. We used the Sarama library from Shopify. So, I basically chose Go because it seemed like a good starting point. As far as Badger DB, I did some searches on the internet for Go key value databases and just saw what the landscape looked like. 
And after looking at a bunch of different options, I ended up picking Badger. And these are the things that resonated with me. First, it was native Go. So I didn't have to run a separate database server. It was embedded and it was self-contained. The API seemed really good. They had really good documentation and it was actively maintained. Um, the algorithm it's based on is called an LSM tree, which one of the benefits you get out of that is uh, lexicographic key iteration. And then uh, Badger also uses memory mapping, which I've used in the past in my uh, high frequency trading uh, days. And I know that could really be useful for efficiently loading data in and out of memory. So I thought these were all good uh, characteristics. I did a quick proof of concept and it worked for me pretty much right away out of the box. I was very satisfied with that. One of the things I'd like to touch on is sort of the development philosophy of this project. Um, first, I'm a big believer in testing and unit testing and integration testing. And so with, uh, with this, uh, pretty much 85% of the code has good testing coverage. And it was pretty easy to add unit tests that talk directly to Badger. It's easy to start up a database and just click, click, wipe it out because it's all self-contained. I also wanted to be able to iterate. Um, this is uh, something that I've long believed is super valuable. I spent a lot of time doing automation and figuring out a way to quickly uh, rerun the same bit of code over and over and over again with as little uh, sort of pain points as possible. Um, so the speed of Go and BadgerDB allowed me to have extremely fast, write some code, write some tests, and then run it and see what happens. Those loops were extremely important. I also wanted to be able to focus on particular sections of data that might be problematic. We did end up having uh, data cleanliness issues. This is not a surprise for anyone who's done any type of work of this sort, even with machine learning. So just getting able to find those edge cases, those corner cases in our algorithm and focus our attention was extremely important. And I mainly did this by having command line options that were used mostly in development to say, start at this offset or start at this timestamp, limit to 5,000 records. And then finally, being able to start from scratch was ex extremely, it's, it's a good mindset. If you can wipe something clean, even your laptop, and rebuild it as quickly as possible, it, you're less, uh, you're, it sort of frees you from being afraid to make changes or experiment. So these were all sort of important philosophies I followed in the past that I was able to sort of expand on and take advantage of because of Go and Badger. I'll real quickly go through the performance. Um, just to give you an idea of how this works. So to extract everything from Kafka, that's the 59 million plus events, that took three hours and 52 minutes. This is really fast compared to other systems we have at the New York Times. Um, we, this is running in the same, this is in production, this is in the same uh, availability zone, so the network bandwidth is about as quick as you can get. This is pretty cool. Then most of the other steps in the algorithm were passing over this data. and. The time range for these things was from 34 minutes down to 10 minutes. So for example, to uh, that first pass, taking stuff out of Kafka, we put it into a key value database where we stored it by offset to the encoded event. The second pass assigned unique uh, timestamps to each event and then did some stuff with our historical assets. Um, but that took 34 minutes. Um, to, and then another 27 minutes to sort of coalesce those, we essentially wanted to use only the latest version of each historical asset. Uh, doing a pass to look for missing references only took 17 minutes over 56 million events. Uh, a second pass to do some cleanup, like deleting references that were no longer there, that took 10 minutes. So the point is like being able to iterate over 58 million events in 10 minutes is pretty astonishing. Uh, so a couple more steps here. Um, the final point in the process was to actually download the full binaries from Kafka so that we could republish them. We were able to download 394 gigabytes of data, that's 35 million assets, in just two hours and seven minutes. And then the final republish, for people who are curious, took over a day and a half. And that's mainly because Kafka, uh, that we use Kafka in a way that we require confirmation from two out of three brokers just to ensure that the message has actually been received. So that, uh, that wait for confirmation just adds a little time to publish these 35 million assets. So just some final notes before I get to the code. Um, we had 17 separate Badger databases um, storing 464 gig of data. 
Uh, the initial version we used was Badger 1.6. I actually upgraded to 2.0 as I was preparing this talk, and I reran uh, the sort, and it was actually 10% faster with uh, Badger 2.0. Uh, the speed and the locality of having all this data on a single machine allowed us to ask questions and explore in ways that we hadn't really been able to do as quickly before. So, for example, I'm, on a separate project I'm working on, I needed to know the the cardinality of the parent-child relationships. Like for example, to calculate all the URIs of more than 100 referrers. I was able to write a program to do that in about an hour. Uh, one result of that is the actual image with the most referrers inside of our system is to uh, Paul Krugman, Krugman, sorry Paul. Uh, he's one of our most prolific uh, opinion writers and uh, it shows in the number of referrers to his, uh, his face. All right, so Here's uh, the before picture, uh, a lot of stuff going on here, a lot of historical publishes. Here's the after picture. So we took 59 million assets down to 35, and now they're chronological, chronologically ordered. Uh, you can pick an easily scan using Kafka's capability to, sort, uh, to uh, scan to a date and pick up the assets you need from a particular year. All right, let's talk about some code. So before I begin, I have a few disclaimers. So I'm new to Go. I consider myself sort of mostly a Scala thinker now, although I did a lot of Java in the past. So I'm not sure that all of my code is 100% idiomatic Go in terms of error handling or variable names. I tend to like longer names. I, th I think that's okay. Like it's, it's not dogma necessarily. You can use your style and adopt Go to it as well as adopting yourself to Go style. Uh, there may be some better approaches to what I've done. I'd love to hear feedback. Um, the good news is the way I think about this is there is a different way to imp uh, implement something. It's easy for me to try that out because I have really good test coverage. So if there's a better way or I think of something later, I'm sure a year from now when I look at code I wrote today, I'll go, I know a better way to do this. So when I think about Go, as I said, I'm new to Go. Um, it has influenced my thinking. What's been interesting is that in the past, I would think of copying and pasting code uh, as something to be highly discouraged. But you know, I've sort of let the Go philosophy uh, seep into my brain, and I, I see the value in that. I'm I'm more apt to copy stuff, although I will break out things into common libraries if like three or more projects start using it. Um, I am skeptical about adding dependencies. I, I want to sort of keep that as low as possible, and I really appreciate the simplicity. Um, especially coming from like decoding aspect J in Java or annotations in Spring. Uh, there's something nice about the code is just the code. You, even if you have to deal with a lot of the error handling, which sort of bloats out your code a little bit. That said, there's some things I miss. I really like the functional features of Scala, like map and filter, um, just transitioning uh, you know, a slice of one data to a slice of another or filtering out stuff is kind of a pain in Go. Um, you get used to it, but it's a lot of excess code. Um, there's places where I wish I'd had immutable data structures where I had structs that I couldn't change. Um, uh, and then I do miss generics. You'll see in some of the wrappers that I wrote that um, generics could have helped, but they're coming soon. So hopefully they'll be cool. All right, so I've got eight examples I'm gonna walk through, um, <coughs> sort of, what I did to use Badger, some interesting, what I thought were interesting coding trivia as, as I built out this uh, sorting process. So the first thing is we built a wrapper around Badger. So the, the, the things that were creating databases, uh, so we obscured some of the finer details of dealing with the Badger API and created a wrapper. Um, this is a, a common thing I think you have to do when you're writing software. Uh, so the initial wrapper just wraps the Badger database. We tell it where the data lives and the name and then provide access to the common things like closing. Uh, for unit tests, we provide access to dropping all and deleting the database. And then we use sequences in the, in the right batch for performance, which I'll show you later. Uh, then we provided accessors. So um, this is where generics would have been nice. Um, basically, for e I wanted type safe ways to uh, represent the keys and the values that go into Badger. So for example, I had a need to have a string pointing to a long. This was like a URI pointing to its ID. I also needed the reverse. So I ended up having 
method naming like this. Um, uh, one thing that's, uh, there's no operator or, uh, method overloading like there is in Java, so you sort of have to come up with a unique name. It, it works, that's fine. Uh, here's another one where uh, when we wanted to store a struct or more complex data into Badger, we had this interface uh, called Byte Marshaller, which any struct could implement to turn itself into bytes and marshal itself back out of bytes. Uh, the other thing I'll point out real quick is um, memory management. So a typical user of, of our wrapper is like this binary info struct, which has uh, the database itself and then it has two reusable data structures for getting data in and out of Badger. That's a byte slice for fetching stuff out of Badger. You reuse the same byte every time and you save on memory allocations and garbage collection. And the same thing with the byte buffers, which is used to marshal and unmarshal uh, the uh, byte marshal or structs. All right. The second wrapper we wrote is uh, called batch DB. So the, ba the, uh, the Badger FAQ recommends using their write batch to speed up writes. One of the problems with write batch is that they're inside of a transaction. So if you insert 100 records, like say keys pointing to IDs, and you need to look up those keys before the write batch is done, you can't do that out of the box. So we wrote a wrapper that allowed uh, both batch, that basically allowed batch writes, but you could read back non-committed writes. And we did that just using an internal cache, of basically a map. The performance improvement was incredible. So I wrote a, a little test to test the performance difference inserting a million records into a database. And it was a nine times improvement when using uh, a batch size of 10,000. So inserting 10,000 at a time versus one at a time, you get this nine times improvement. We tended, so I, I sort of did this experimentation to find the sweet spot. It, for us, it was around 10,000. That's what we use for most of our stuff. I backed it down to 1,000 batch size for some of our larger data, just so I wasn't keeping as much data in memory. But this is, this is pretty important. Use write batch uh, to get fast uh, inserts into your database. This is what the wrapper looked like. Um, basically, uh, we'd have a pointer to the database, the write batch, and then the internal cache, which was just a map. Um, and then uh, our, uh, here's a wrapper of the string long pair. So notice that uh, because I'm dealing with two data structures at the same time, I want it to be uh, what I think of as thread safe or go routine safe. Uh, so I use the go read write lock, which allows you to have slightly different locks on getting versus setting, which can help with performance and uh, performance. Uh, the other thing to note is on the set, you'll see a call to save. This is where we save the data to the internal map. And then I have a, uh, a batch count. So when it gets up to the 10,000, that's when it flushes the right batch to the database and clears the internal memory cache. So this worked pretty well for us. All right, so let's talk about encoding. Um, so this was the data we wanted to gather uh, to do the sorting process. It was all that basically the key information we needed, the offset, the unique URI, the publication dates, um, the MD5, and then all of its references. To encode an asset with three references took about 777 bytes. So to reduce this size, I wanted to encode the string data. There's some string data like the event ID and the MD5, which were unique to every asset. So there's no clever way or there, to, to reduce the size of those, so I kind of ignored those. However, there were some uh, static string lists which had a fixed small number of values, and that was things like the source system, which published this asset, and also the event type. Was it a publish, was it an unpublish, was it a redirect, things like that. So for these fixed static lists, I used what I think of as Go enumerations, and this is how I implemented it. I basically had and in this case, there was only four, four values, but I had a struct, which the name and then the encoded byte. I was under 256 values, so I, could, so I could use a byte. And then to load up these things, I used the init method in the package. So when this package is loaded, this is run once. I build up the two maps for looking up by name and looking up by byte. And then I have a pretty simple uh, enumeration. The second thing I wanted to reduce size on is the unique ID. So each asset has 
this URI, which can be up to 63 characters. I didn't really want to store that because I'm going to store that as references as well as in the original asset. And then there's also this path we stored, which is if you walk down the struct to get to the reference, we needed to keep track of that for later on when we cleaned it up and republished it. So these things varied in size. There were 22 million unique URIs. There were thousands of references. So I couldn't use a fixed list. I didn't know all the values in advance. So to do that, I basically used a, ba a couple of Badger databases paired with a sequence. So I had one database which had a string mapped to a, a long, a 64-bit integer. And then I had the reverse lookup. And everything in the sorting algorithm dealt with the IDs. And then when I output stuff for debugging purposes, I used the reverse lookup. And this is what <coughs> the code looked like. When I was getting a string for a long, I'd first, uh, if it didn't exist, uh, then I'd drop down and I'd pull the next sequence number from the Badger sequence. And I'd store those, the, the two pairs in the database. Um, this code itself is, uh, doesn't show is not thread safe. The way in which I was using it didn't require locks, but it'd be easier to wrap a lock around this to make sure these were updated concurrently. So going back to our encoding, when we look at what does that look like when we encode this data? So this is the actual struct we use when we encoded this information. Um, we turned uh, long strings into IDs like URI and ref URI and field path. And then we turned smaller strings, but still 20, up to 22 bytes into single bytes. And when we encoded the same information, three references goes down to 167 bytes versus 777. So that's 21% of the original, which allowed us uh, to store more data on disk and keep in a smaller amount of disk and also in memory. So this structure, like how do we turn that actually into bytes to store into Badger? Because the Badger interface is just bytes lists. So we have this interface for doing marshalling and we rolled our own, basically. So I looked at uh, GOB, maybe it's pronounced GOB, uh, to do this, but it turns out it uses four times as much space to encode a struct. And I, we also use Protobus quite predominantly here at the New York Times, but I also didn't want the overhead of that either. So I decided just these structs were fairly small. I would just write them field by field. Uh, the binary interface, the binary package is, is pretty nice. Pretty simple. This is what it takes to, uh, it, it can actually embed, uh, encode structs as long as there's no variable data in there, as long as there's no slices or strings. And this is what it looks like. I've removed the error handling code because it was too, uh, took up too much space. And then here's the, the corresponding read. So you, again, you read field by field from the, from the byte stream data and you reconstruct your data. So this works really well. It's fast. The only downside is once I've put data on disk and I want to add a field or change a field, I have no means of really fix, easy means of fixing that. Um, turns out that wasn't a big problem for us, mainly because our iteration speed, like if I wanted to recreate the entire database, it only took a few hours. Um, so in the end, uh, this structure sort of finalized on its final format relatively quickly, and it never became a point of pain where I had to think about versioning versions of this data. Although you could conceive of a way to add that by putting a version number and sort of selectively, basically building what protobuf does. But for us, this worked really well. Okay, we mentioned earlier, so I'm putting all these assets uh, in, uh, into a database. I'm using timestamps as keys. Uh, so as, we, as many people know, we use uh, Unix time is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. And then Go adds nanosecond precision. So if you have a time uh, uh, struct, you can say Unix nano, and it'll give you a nanosecond precision value. And then dates before 1970 are negative. So in this example, I added and subtracted two days from the 1970 date, which gets me to 1969, 1230, or 1970, January 3rd. Just want to show you negative dates are how we go before 1970 which is important to us because we have stuff going all the way back to 1851. So just a brief refresher on what endianness is. There's sort of two ways to represent a number in binary. And this is important because we use the binary representation to do sorting when we're iterating by key and badger. It's in lexicographic order. So it's basically in 
how those binary bits would be sorted uh, are important. So there's big NDN, also called network order, where the most significant components of the number come first, and then little NDN, where the most significant components come last. So to give you an example, here's a bunch of numbers from negative 1,000 to positive 1,000 in their little NDN and big NDN formats. Now, if I sort these, if you sort of treat them as strings and you just do a sort on them, you end up with this. In big NDN, if you were to walk through these keys, you'd start at zero, get to the highest number, then you'd start at the biggest negative number and go back to zero. Little Indian has sort of the reverse problem. You start at zero and go to the biggest negative number, start at the biggest positive number, and go back um, to zero. So this was interesting. I ran into this when I was loading my first data. I didn't really think about this off the top of my head. And when I was sorting, when I started to iterate by key, I'm like, why am I starting at 1970? Where's all my data from before that? And then I remembered, oh, it's used complement. Aha. So in order to solve this, we basically reset the zero date. So we transform any date from 1851 and we add essentially the number of days between 1851 and 1970 and pull all dates forward. So every negative uh, uh, int 64 becomes an unsigned int 64. And this is essentially the code that we used to do that. So we set a start date. I just picked January 1st, 1851 for simplicity, then have a couple methods to easily transform them. So when we're inserting data into Badger, we first take, like in this example, we take the last modified date, we get the nanos, and then we convert it to an unsigned timestamp. All right. So while we're on the topic of timestamps, the other thing is, is each timestamp had to actually be unique. So we're putting it into a key value database. So I want each asset not to overwrite other assets. So the question is, what happens if two assets have the same timestamp? Uh, and this can happen. Um, it's, it's rare, but you can get the same millisecond. Um, so we add nanoseconds. We basically use those extra digits uh, as a counter, essentially. And this leads to an interesting problem. So our uh, figuring out our timestamp is basically this little loop. So I look and see if that timestamp is used in the database, and if it's not, I just pick the next one and I keep looping until I find an empty slot, basically. However, our historical assets, so you go back to 1851, there might be a thousand articles published on that day. And we didn't assign, we didn't know when they were published. They're all published just on that day in the paper. So they all have the same timestamp in our system, typically at 5 a.m. They might have thousands on the same day. And so if you do the math, the first time I look up a number on the same day, I'll do one hit to the database, and then I'll do two, and then I'll do three. And so if we do just 1,000, that ends up being 500,500 lookups, which is an n-squared problem. So I had inadvertently written n-squared code without really understanding my data, which was interesting. So here's how we solved that. So we basically created a timestamp cache um, where uh, for a given second, I would keep track of uh, has that second been used to, to, to create a unique nanosecond. And the key thing here is I only did it for seconds that had no milliseconds because all this historical data uh, that came from the archive all had no milliseconds. Regular stuff that we publish day to day would only have zero, zero, zero milliseconds one in a thousand times. So what this lets me basically do is I don't have to keep an entry in this map for every single unique timestamp, only for the ones that are historical. So that's like 365 days times you know, 150 years, and then one in a thousand from the last two years. And so our code basically looks like this. We first check this local cache to determine this the unique sort timestamp, as I call it. And if it's there, I use that. Otherwise, then I do that loop that I showed you before. Um, the code from the previous page, the save uh, method, it's called elsewhere, it was too complicated to show on this, but uh, it's a saved lighter. So essentially it works great. And that turned um, this problem into a linear problem instead of n squared, which really helped performance. Um, so the next thing I like to talk about is error handling and what I learned about using panic and recover. So during the encoding process, there was code that could be paralyzed. So I was doing some sort of performance tweaking 
uh, that calculating the MD5 and getting the references uh, were not, uh, they, they were orthogonal to each other. And they, they both took a little bit of time. So I wanted to parallelize them. So I basically did this. I created a weight group, two little go routines, they did their thing, and then the weight group waited for it to be done. Now I encountered a problem at some point where one of these things was throwing a panic. And this was causing me an issue because with Badger it's important to shut down cleanly. So I wasn't catching that panic and my data was essentially corrupted in a sense. So I wanted to be able to catch the panic and return cleanly. So I essentially wrote a helper method which uh, calls recover and then it sets uh, an error bring in an error pointer, and if there was a panic, it sets uh, an error message into that error pointer. And so its use looks like this, where I have a couple of variables outside the Go routines, and uh, I defer this exit to catch panic. And if the panic occurs, it'll set the error in those error messages, and I can check them later. You notice at the bottom, I check them both and sort of return them together. This is an interesting uh, thing I haven't researched a lot in Go, which is what's the best way to return multiple errors. Um, I've seen a couple solutions for this, but in this particular case, um, this was fine for our use case. Uh, a couple of things to learn is uh, deferred functions are still invoked during a panic, so the, the wait group done is still called, which is nice. I didn't really sort of realize that, that all deferred methods are invoked. Um, you can also use this catch panic uh, inside of a method, sort of inside of a go routine. So in this case, the broken function, it'll, uh, I'm using a named return value. And if something happens during this function, it'll, this uh, catch panic error will set the value into that return value, which gets returned back. Uh, the other thing to note is when a panic occurs, uh, the default values of anything that wasn't set are also returned. So in this case, done would set the false. All right, and my last example is exiting cleanly. So again, I mentioned before, it's very important for Badger to close cleanly so that it writes in, in memory information to disk. And uh, I was writing this on the command line, so I want to be able to stop the program using control C. So the way you do that is you uh, use signal.notify to catch the signals you're interested in. And essentially what I would do is it would trigger the signal and then it would set this flag called exit requested. And then basically in my, uh, in my program, I was looping over calls to Kafka. Everything I was doing was basically incremental doing essentially an asset at a time. So all of my stuff had loops that looked essentially like this. So if someone hit control C, this flag would get set and then the do work would exit cleanly, which would allow the Badger cleanup code to actually work properly. The other thing I wanted to do was um, put some of these scripts in bash scripts. And I wanted to know if they had an error or not so they could stop the bash script processing. So that's what this exit with status is. It's essentially the very first defer function that I call. There we go. It's the very first defer function that I call, which means it's the last thing that happens before the program exits. In this case, I call os.exit. And if the error message the error variable it's sort of monitoring is not nil, then I exit one, which will tell bash script or zcell script that some error occurred. So the thing to remember with deferred functions is that uh, the, the variables you pass into them aren't invoked until the method is invoked itself. So in this case, if do work uh, returns an error, uh, the program will exit with a status of one. All right. so. That's pretty much my talk. I'd like to just have the few things which sort of stuck through me through this product project. Um, sometimes you can solve a large data problem on a small machine. Uh, not everything's big data, even 59 million records. You can do something interesting on a laptop or in production on a, you know, a relatively small instance in the cloud. So it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it's cool to use even in today's day and age when a lot of cool problems are big data. Uh, don't underestimate the value of extremely fast iteration cycles. Spend the time to remove those pain points, to make things repeatable, to start from scratch. Uh, and uh, this has been very important on this project, but I've used it elsewhere. Just have everything as much automated as possible. No manual steps. 
it'll make your life much easier. Um, I think Go is well suited for this algorithm. Uh, like I said, I sort of think of it as close to the metal. I was able to tweak the structs and the way it uses uh, memory uh, in a way that I got extremely fast performance. And then finally, I really enjoy working with Go and Badger. Um, they've been a pleasure to work with. So I wrote about this uh, in an NYT Open post. If you search for Doug Donahoe NYT Open or go to this tiny URL, uh, dd-myt-59, you can read about it. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a thing or two.